the 19th century, the Danish scholar C.J. Thompson devised what we call the 3H system. This was a way of framing major developments in the human past. We start off with the Stone Age, where people relied mostly on stone tools, followed by an age of bronze, and then an age of iron. Although it's not representative of developments in all regions of the globe, such as in most of Africa or the Americas, archaeologists consider it a useful timeline to work with when studying the prehistory of many parts of the Old World. These ages were later divided into smaller periods, and the last period of the Stone Age, the Neolithic, marks a major moment in human prehistory because it is associated with the adoption of agriculture and the shift towards permanent settlements. Then before we get into the Bronze Age proper, there is a transition period called the Chalcolithic, or the Copper Age, and it was during this period that more advanced experiments with metallurgy are supposed to have begun. This new paper, however, throws our timeline into question. I'm Madam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I'll review the evidence presented by this paper and investigate a question raised by its findings. Could advanced experimentation with metallurgy have taken place more than 9,000 years ago, thousands of years earlier than thought, during the early Neolithic period? People, of course, didn't just wake up one morning thousands of years ago and decide that they were going to start smelting ores to make objects. Metallurgy, like all other great human accomplishments, developed over time. People in the Old World began by cold-working metals, like copper, in their native state from at least the early Neolithic period. Native metals refer to metals that can be found in their natural form and do not need to be extracted from ores, and one of the first metals that people started exploiting in this manner was copper. Native copper was then modified and shaped into objects using so-called cold techniques, like cutting, carving, grinding, and hammering or rolling. Sometimes, techniques employing temperatures up to just a few hundred degrees Celsius were used as well, such as annealing. But archaeologists don't consider this much of a technological feat because people at the time were already heating flint. Some examples of objects made using these earlier metalworking techniques using native copper include beads, pendants, pins, hooks, and more from Chayunutepezi in Turkey, dated from around 9000 BC onwards, beads from Ashiklihoyuk, also in Turkey, dated to the 8th millennium, and a bead from the site of Ali Kosh in Iran, dated to the mid-7th millennium. The process involved in producing these artifacts is very different from extractive metallurgy, and more specifically pyrometallurgy, which involves the extraction of metals from ores through smelting, since this requires knowledge of the chemical and physical properties of raw materials. In other words, people need to know how very high temperatures can alter these properties of the raw materials they're working with. Copper isn't only found in a native state, it can also originate from ores. Ores are naturally occurring minerals from which metals can be extracted. The ancients discovered that they could do this through a pyrometallurgical process called smelting. Smelting involves exposing an ore to very high temperatures in a controlled environment, usually within a furnace, in order to extract the metal we want and separate it from other minerals and impurities. Smelting was a major metallurgical advancement. As this paper states, the distinction between the cold working of copper and high temperature processes, which alter the properties of raw materials, is important for defining metallurgical activities." End quote. These more advanced experiments with pyrometallurgy are supposed to have come much later in the Old World timeline. It was long thought that the origins of extractive metallurgy lay in the Near East during the mid-5th millennium BC, marking a period which came to be termed the Chalcolithic, as I outlined earlier. But the earliest uncontroversial, securely dated evidence for extractive metallurgy at the moment comes from the site of Belovod in Serbia, associated with the Neolithic Vincha culture, and dates to around 5000 BC. When this paper came out back in 2010, it was a groundbreaking finding at the time because it pushed the origins of smelting back by about half a millennium, making it an innovation of the later Neolithic period as opposed to the Chalcolithic period. Now, this new paper, Early Copper Production by the Last Hunter-Gatherers, published in the Journal of Archaeological Science Reports, has found evidence suggesting that people may have been processing ores at the site of Grefila in southeastern Turkey as early as 10,800 years ago, during a period we call the Pre-Pottery Neolithic B. That's thousands of years earlier than previously thought. We can find out about the technological processes involved in the creation of metal artifacts and figure out if a copper object was made using coal techniques or if pyrometallurgical practices were employed through the application of certain scientific techniques. There's actually an entire subfield of archaeological science devoted to the scientific study of metals. It's called archaeometallurgy. 
Archaeometallurgists study things like the chemical content and microstructural characteristics of their samples, and these allow them to identify whether smelted or native copper was used and find out what techniques were employed in the manufacturing of a copper object. Some evidence that a copper object originated from an ore include the finding of slag, a byproduct of smelting, but sometimes this needs to be scientifically tested to prove that the slag originated from smelting activities and not another fire involving event, and the detection of trace element impurities such as nickel, zinc, arsenic, lead, cobalt, antimony, chromium, or iron. In this new study, the researchers wanted to see if two particular artifacts recovered from the site, this vitrified soil material and a bar-shaped copper object, could provide evidence that the inhabitants of Grafila were experimenting with advanced metallurgical activities or pyrometallurgy. The paper mentions that copper ores had been found in one of the structures, and other copper artifacts had been found at the site as well so it would definitely be interesting to see if the inhabitants of Grafila were smelting ores as part of the production of their copper objects. The artifacts under analysis come from the pre-pottery Neolithic B phase, which has been dated to between 10,800 and 9,500 years ago, or 8,800 and 7,500 BC. So if they provide evidence for extractive metallurgy, they'll push back the origins of this technological advancement another 2,500 to 3,800 years. There's also no chance that the copper objects found in the Neolithic layers at the site are intrusive, originally belonging to a later stratigraphic layer, because the occupation of the site ended with the Potter Neolithic. In other words, there is no Calcolithic or Bronze Age layer. All the copper objects found at the site are from the Neolithic. The question is whether the inhabitants of Grafila made them using so-called cold techniques, or if they were undertaking pyrometallurgical experiments using copper ores. Upon quick glance, the lump of vitrified soil material looks like it had melted on one of its sides. Archaeologists suspected from early on that the lump was a chunk of partially melted copper and soil, so the researchers studied its mineralogical and chemical composition, microstructure, and thermal exposure to see if it could be associated with pyrometallurgy. The short answer is yes. These suggest that the inhabitants of Grafila had an advanced understanding of fire control and were perhaps experimenting with pyrometallurgy not just thousands of years before the Calcolithic period, but also before Neolithic settlements had even become well established. What exactly did the researchers find? First, the finding of certain minerals, like tritomite, and microstructural features, such as calcite crystals, revealed that the material had been exposed to very high temperatures of around 1000 degrees Celsius and then rapidly cooled. Second, they identified small droplets of copper within the vitrified soil lump, confirming that molten copper was mixed in with the soil and thus indicating that the metal, either in native form or originating from an ore, was exposed to high temperatures. Meanwhile, the fluid texture on one side of the lump and a depression on the other together suggest that this vitrified material was exposed to a heat source while in contact with a structure's inner surface. This strongly suggests that it was not only exposed to very high temperatures, but that this exposure took place in a controlled environment, in some sort of fire installation, hinting at deliberate pyrometallurgical experimentation. But is there evidence of smelting? Although this can't be 100% confirmed at the moment, ore processing is suggested from the finding of elevated concentrations of chromium, lead, and zinc, since these are impurities associated with copper ores. It's also suggested from the finding of chromite spinels, which point to ore processing as opposed to the mere melting of native copper. Together, all of these suggest a potential association between this vitrified soil material and ore processing at Grafila. The researchers also noted in the paper that fused materials associated with lime kilns at archaeological sites in the Levant also exhibit similar mineralogical properties, and since terrazzo floors had been found at Grefila, it's possible that this vitrified soil material is associated with lime preparation. However, the finding of copper droplets suggests that an association with metallurgical activities is more likely. As for the bar-shaped copper object, which may have been part of an unfinished chisel axe, they studied the elemental composition and microstructural characteristics of the artifact to determine, was this object made from native or smelted copper? The chemical analysis revealed that this object was made from very pure copper and that it contained only trace amounts of nickel and zinc. Microstructural analysis revealed porosity holes, which suggests that the copper melted to liquid and then solidified quickly, and it also showed chromium-rich formations, which can be associated with the smelting of copper ores. The object also exhibited evidence of annealing after casting. For sure the copper was exposed to high heat, but whether it was smelted or not, unfortunately, cannot be determined for sure with these characteristics. The finding of chromium formation suggests that the copper may well have originated from an ore, but the high purity of the copper suggests that native copper could have been melted and then cast, 
or that people could have smelted very high copper content ores like malachite, followed by casting and annealing. Overall, while smelting cannot be confirmed, it also cannot be ruled out because the chromium is suggestive of possible ore processing. It's also worth noting that lead isotope analysis, performed to determine the geographical source of the copper, showed that the bar-shaped object matched ore deposits in Trabzon, so there's some evidence to suggest that the copper originated from an ore, but the high purity renders it difficult to confirm for sure. The researchers are cautious about how they interpret their findings, and more work is needed to confirm the possibility that Greyfila's inhabitants started smelting copper ore sometime between 8800 and 7500 BC. However, in light of these new findings, I think the idea that people were experimenting with pyrometallurgy more than 9000 years ago should be taken seriously. Sure, archaeologists haven't found slag there, a byproduct of the smelting process and thus a telltale sign of this keen pyrometallurgical activity, and the function of the one furnace that has been found at the site hasn't been established with certainty, but it doesn't seem likely to me that the vitrified soil material resulted from copper melting after an ore was accidentally left too close to a fire, as has been suggested, since the surfaces of the material provide evidence that it was exposed to heat while in contact with the inner surface of a structure, likely some type of fire installation. This is more suggestive of experimentation with pyrometallurgy as opposed to a mere accident. I'll also note, as I have before in some of my other episodes, that absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Let's also consider the copper ores that were found at the site. What were the inhabitants of Griffula doing with them? One of the earliest uses of copper ores, particularly malachite, in general was as a pigment. However, there is no evidence that the residents of Griffula were using the ores for this specific purpose. The only pigment noted here is red ochre found within structures. Also, a variety of copper ore types were found at Grafila, suggesting that the inhabitants of the settlement were not choosing ores solely for their pigmentation properties. So, what were they doing with these ores? Experimenting with power metallurgy seems, based on the current evidence, a good possibility. This paper leaves us with more questions and answers, but it also leaves the door open to the possibility that people were smelting ores more than 9,000 years ago. And the study's findings certainly suggest that at least experimentation with some more advanced pyrometallurgical techniques, such as controlled use of fire and casting, were taking place in southeastern Anatolia between 9,500 and 10,800 years ago. I won't be surprised if we find more evidence for early experimentation with pyrometallurgy at other sites in the region because lead isotope analysis revealed that the source of the copper for the bar-shaped object was not the mines nearby, but most likely Trabzon, by the Black Sea suggesting that the raw materials were acquired through trade or exchange. The dawn of the Neolithic may be an overlooked and yet important phase in early pyrometallurgical developments. Looking back at the timeline, it's becoming clear that the past is much more complex than this linear timeline of technological development. The Bellevode paper already challenged the timeline to a certain degree when it made it clear that smelting originated before the Calcolithic. But the 2025 paper now suggests that pyrometallurgical experimentation is not an innovation of the Calcolithic or even of the later Neolithic, but rather an innovation of the early Neolithic, what we call the pre-pottery Neolithic in Anatolia, and this is extremely significant because this was a time when Anatolians are supposed to be experimenting with new ways of living, they're starting to rely more on farming and agriculture rather than solely on hunting and gathering, and they're starting to live more sedentary lifestyles, but these developments are in their early stages at this time, and the sedentary way of life had not been well established yet. The inhabitants of Grefila hadn't mastered power metallurgy yet, but they were certainly experimenting with power metallurgical techniques that were advanced for their time. Subscribe for more cool content by our go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.